All right, thank you, everybody. I think we might go ahead and uh, get started with our program for this evening. Uh, my name is Harriet Harvey Horn. I am co-chair, along with the amazing Terry McGrew, of the San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the Climate Reality Project. On behalf of our chapter, I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's event featuring a discussion of gray water systems for homes with guest speaker, Laura Allen. And of course, you know, with what's going on with climate in California and the drought and the water table dropping um, and with the amount of energy it takes to pump water, um, this is a very, very timely topic and one that is on at top, at top of mind and gray water systems are a solution out there that I think it's best for all of us to be um, informed about. So we're delighted to have this program um and we thank you for joining us i also want to note that this evening uh, the event this evening is being recorded and it will be available on the climate reality bay area youtube channel within the next week or so per our custom we will open with a land acknowledgement with respect we acknowledge the ohlone miwok patwin and other indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands we currently occupy in the greater San Francisco Bay region. This land acknowledgement helps remind us of the historic and ongoing oppression of indigenous, indigenous people, how the taking and occupying of indigenous lands and the exploitation of indigenous people and, and those lands is directly connected to the climate crisis and how building relationships with and following the leadership of indigenous people here and everywhere is crucial as we seek and build long-term solutions to the global climate crisis. Uh, what I'd like to do next is see, if, is there anyone here for whom this is your very first Climate Reality Bay Area event? Give us a wave with your real or virtual hand. It's really, I'm gonna to switch back over here. Do we have any new people? Now, oh, good, we have at least, we have Katrin Kellett. Thank you for joining us this evening. And I believe I might've seen perhaps Adam raise his hand as well. So we're and glad Christine to have- Christine Starkey. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us. We're delighted to have you here and welcome you to this first event. Um, we will start by sharing a little bit about our parent organization, the Climate Reality Project, and then the Bay Area Chapter. The Climate Reality Project is an international nonprofit organization founded and chaired by former U.S. Vice President and Nobel Laureate Al Gore. Mr. Gore founded the organization in 2006, shortly after the release of his award-winning documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. The organization's mission is to mobilize a global grassroots network of climate advocates. Today, climate reality spans 170 countries with over 35,000 climate reality leaders around the world trained by Mr. Gore to speak truth to power about the climate crisis and its solutions. I might pause here for a second and note that we're about to add another 14,000 to that number next week with the um, a global leadership training event with Mr. Gore and uh, his scientific team. And I guess we probably have any number of people here. Why don't we have another show of hands, people that will be attending leadership training next week. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, everybody, let's give them a round of applause for their commitment to the climate cause and to making um, this important commitment to this organization that is doing so much good around the world. So thank you all for that. So I'll move on and tell you a little bit about our chapter. It is one of over 120 nationwide chapters focused on taking urgent action to address the climate and climate justice crises at the local level. We have over 1400 members in our chapter across the greater San Francisco Bay Area region, making ours one of the largest chapters in the world. We actively promote climate action with efforts focused on pushing government at all levels to adopt policies that ensure a just transition to a safer, healthier, decarbonized future. And on advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice to bring frontline communities to the forefront of climate action. Our members give motivational climate presentations, advocate for policy action, build alliances, 
promote climate justice, youth climate action, and business engagement, as well as engage in local government policy efforts by our county-based squads. We regularly host events like this, as well as workshops and advocacy opportunities. We welcome you to join us if you're not already a member and follow us on social media. Uh, Sue Yoshiwara this evening is uh, from our events team, is uh, supporting us with the production efforts this evening. We really appreciate that, Sue. And she will share in the chat a link to our website where you can find a lot more information about our chapter's work as well as a link to join and become involved in other ways. You can also easily find us by Googling Climate Reality Bay Area as well. Now, without further ado, I'll turn the program over to Carolyn Gugamos, another member of our amazing uh, events co-chair team to introduce our program and our speaker. Thank you so much, Harriet. Um, I wanted to start this out by saying that I'm the, I reached out to Laura to, to do this because I had started reading her book called Gray Water, Green Landscape, and I'm absolutely fascinated by the idea of some, some simple changes um, that, that can be made, at least for me, at, on the home front, and I really wanted to, to share this concept with those in climate reality and beyond. Um, Laura Allen is a founding member of Gray Water Action and has spent the past 20 years exploring simple and ecological water solutions. She is the lead author of San Francisco Gray Water Design Guidelines for Outdoor Irrigation and authored The Water Wise Home, How to Conserve and Reuse Water in Your Home and Landscape, and Gray Water Green Landscape. She has a BA in Environmental Science, a teaching credential, and a master's degree in education. Laura leads classes and workshops on rainwater harvesting, gray water reuse, and composting toilets. Laura has presented widely on gray water reuse, including at the Water Smart Innovations Conference, Bioneers, California Environmental Health Association Conference, and California Landscape Contractors Association Conference. She participated in state gray water code developments in California and Washington State, and is on the Technical Advisory Committee for IAPMO's Water Efficiency Standard. Laura was featured in an Ask This Old House episode on gray water and was the 2014 recipient of the Silicon Valley Water Conservation Award of Water Champion. Um, and so I think with that, I will turn our presentation this evening over to Laura. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here this evening. And it's great to see all of you coming out to learn about gray water. I'm gonna share my screen and then we'll get started. Just let me know if you can see this okay. Yeah, okay. So for most of us, when we turn on the tap or the shower, water comes out, it's like magic. But we often forget that if we weren't using the water in our home, it would have been somewhere. No matter where we live, water came out of a natural source. If it came from the ground, it could have been coming up in a spring. If it came from a river somewhere that could have flowed for a fish and all the other wildlife that need that water. And so we, every single day as we use water in our home, we're directly connected to watersheds. And they're often far away from our home. If we live in cities like the Bay Area, our water comes from really far from us. So we don't get to see that visual impact that we're having on the watersheds, but it's still there. And then we use water in our homes and many people have no idea how much water they use. So I just want you to think, do you know how much water you use every day? This is a gallons per day question. Um, and if you live with more people, you couldn't have figured out how many gallons each of you use. So if you don't know that, it's a little mini homework assignment, find out. And it turns out that Americans on average use more than anybody else in the world for water use, which is not too surprising, but uh, it means we have a lot of opportunity to do better. We have a lot of water, even when there's shortages, we just don't use it in the most uh, wise way all the time or use it for the most important things. And so if you see this chart starting at the, the left side of the screen, this is very arid places where there's water scarcity. People don't have enough water to meet their basic health and sanitation needs like Mozambique, uh, one gallon per person per day. And there is a threshold, it's called a water poverty threshold. That's 13 gallons per person per day. That's what every single person needs to be healthy and meet their needs. 
And many people don't have that. When you get past that threshold, that's where most of the, what we call the developed countries or richer nations do are above that threshold, like the United Kingdom at 40 gallons per person per day, France at 76, and then there's a whole range. And I just want you to think for a minute, you know, why, why is the US so much higher, like twice as high as these European, Western European nations that have a very similar standard of living? And just think for a second, you probably are thinking about the landscape. And that is the number one reason we use so much more is because of our irrigation use. And it's also efficiency. Fixture, other countries have longer history of, of having efficient fixtures in the home and appliances, smaller washing machines, more efficient shower heads and toilets and all that. And this, we, we're changing new codes require a lot of efficiency upgrades. But if you haven't upgraded your showers or your toilets or your washing machine for a long time, that's a great place to start because you can get huge savings just by simply changing out a shower head or a toilet for a more efficient one. And there's often rebates for that. And then we use the water, it goes down the drain. And for many people, that's kind of the end of the story. It's just gone, it goes away. But of course, you know that there is no away. It's not really gone. It goes to the sewer treatment plant and then it's discharged. And some places reuse that water on big scale and many places don't. And as you all are aware, California is suffering from an extreme drought. This is not going away um, with climate change. This is becoming the new normal, having drier, um, drier summers, you know, more, you, you guys know all of this. And so this is a great time for us to really rethink how we've been using water and what we can do differently to help our homes become more in tune with recycling and reusing and using a lot less and still having lovely landscapes. It turns out that we typically use about half of all the water in the home and then half outside. And our landscapes don't need potable drinking water. They are completely happy with other qualities of water. And so that's why gray water is such a good match for irrigation. Um, and of course, you know, all these averages I'm telling you that may not be true for you personally, but this is kind of typically we use a lot of, a lot of outdoor water and we can do it differently. And so when there's a drought or any shortages, the messaging is often like, just stop irrigating, don't water your lawn, let it die. And that's super important and definitely a short-term need, but we don't have to just have these dead um, kind of scarcity type landscapes. The last drought was brown was the new green. And it's good that people let their lawns die, but we don't actually need to have that kind of landscape. We can have really lovely, productive landscapes that grow food, that grow habitat, that are beautiful, and they can be irrigated with our own household recycled water. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, how you can do this and kind of the limitations, what it can do, what it can't do. So we're going to go over gray water, some basic info. If this is new to you, um, just get you kind of get a foundation of what, what you need to be thinking about. And then I'm gonna talk about some basic systems, excuse me, some popular systems, and I'll touch on regulations and then kind of some strategies for how to use this water. And there'll be time for questions. So uh, maybe I'll pause in the middle and see if there are any questions, but there'll also be time at the end. And so gray water, if you, gray water is using water in the home and you're taking it outside and using it in the landscape. And you can get between 16 and 40% reduction in water use. And that's a pretty wide percent. So you might be wondering like, why is that you know, such a large range? And it's because not all homes can access all of their gray water. And also you know, landscapes may not need all the water. They may need more of the water. There's just a lot of variation. So it's a pretty wide range, but you can get a pretty significant reduction. Uh, this picture shows a home that was retrofitted for gray water. That means the home was already built and later the people living there said, I wanna reuse my water, How, what can I do? And so what you'll often see with retrofits, which I'm assuming many of you already have a home that you're thinking about using gray water, maybe after tonight, you'll find out it's a great option for you. Maybe you'll find out it, it may not be the, the thing you should be focused on right now. Um, but if your home is built, you have these different sources of water, like in the picture you see showers and baths, there's two of them and each one of these is on a separate system. So you can see in the picture, the upper shower and bath is going to irrigate some trees and the lower one is irrigating some bushes in a different part of the landscape. And then the washing machine is going to irrigate other plants in a different part of the landscape. And that's really how it works when you're thinking about retrofitting gray water. You're looking at your fixtures and you're finding out what you can irrigate. Usually it's your closest plants that are suitable. And I'll talk about what suitable means in a little bit. And then putting these different fixtures together, you are taking off sections of your landscape from potable irrigation. 
Um, you're also, there's also a lot of other benefits. You are managing, you can grow habitat, you can manage the water better. Uh, there is kind of anecdotal information that some of these really saturated, irrigated uh, sites can be fireproof. I mean, not nothing's totally fireproof, but they having a um, very moist landscape is can be help with fire prevention. So there's been some cases of gray water plants surviving um, where other plants did not when there was a fire nearby. You're also reducing flows to your sewer or septic, which can help kind of on the community scale, reduce the energy needed to treat that water, and you're being connected to your water cycles. Um, so there's personal benefits from using gray water, like the personal benefit of doing the right thing and uh, saving water. And then there's community scale benefits, like not using so much water. We don't have to pump that water, clean it. There's a lot of energy embedded in our water, which I'm sure you're aware of. And then treating the water on the down end also takes a lot of energy and resources. So we're conserving on those sides. Um, and then we can also just have these landscapes. We can grow shade trees. We can do other things in our landscapes that are gonna be benefiting the climate and our kind of localized environment. And Californians produce a lot of gray water. There's about a billion gallons every single day that's typically just kind of wasted. Um, we can't access all of this water, but a lot of it. If everyone did a little bit of water, it would really add up. So there's a, there's a bunch of gray water available. And uh, one question, a lot of people interested in gray water, it's because of water savings. That's a primary driver in the arid west. And so do gray water systems actually save water? And they do, they can, but they don't, they don't always. So I just want to call your attention to um, a common design error or somebody who wanted to use gray water but wasn't really thinking about water savings when they plan their system. So the picture, the chart on the left, this is from a study that we did several years ago, looking at water bills of homes that had a gray water system. And well, they looked at their bills before they put in their gray water and then their water bills after so we could see their, how their consumption changed. And overall, we saw a lot of a significant drop, as you can see in that red line, which is pre gray water and the gray line is post. So that's what you want to see. You want to see savings because you're supposed to be re replacing irrigation. Um, the picture on the right is a kind of common and um, easy to make mistake. Somebody wanted a gray water system. They wanted to save water, but they didn't really have the education or think about the design. So they put in new landscaping. They put in new fruit trees right in the middle of their lawn. This is in this picture is from Southern California where green lawns need to be irrigated. And they kept their green lawn. So they kept irrigating with their sprinkler system and then they watered their trees with their gray water system. So really they just double watered their trees and had no savings whatsoever. So if you're thinking about gray water and design, you have to always be thinking about how can I stop irrigating? Maybe I can make a section of my yard that's for my gray water plants, some fruit trees or some trees if you're gonna do new plantings, and then I will shut off irrigation that had been going to that area. Or if you have existing landscapes, you're sending gray water to plants and you're shutting off irrigation. You're capping emitters, you're turning off drip, um, you're not watering anymore. But whatever you do, you have to stop watering the, with what you had been doing before. And then you'll save water. Um, so getting to some of the basics. So gray water is from your washing machines. And this I'm gonna say is the number one place to start because it's typically the easiest source to tap into. And it's typically a pretty significant water use in the home. If you have a top loading machine, those use between 30 and 50 gallons per load. Front loader, 12 to 25 and top efficient, 15 to 25. And so you can think about what machine you have and then multiply your loads per week. And that's a source of irrigation water that you can be using. Showers and baths are another great source. Um, they, the, the shampoos and conditioners we use in the showers and baths are typically fine for gray water. And I'll talk more about products in a minute. Um, typically a big source of water. Um, sometimes it's hard to access this because you have to get into the plumbing. So sometimes people find out, oh, my home is built slab on grade construction. I really cannot get to this shower at all because the drainage pipes are buried in cement. So sometimes you find out that these are not an option for you depending on how your home was built. But other times, if you have a crawl space or a basement or easy access to your plumbing, you can pretty simply tap into these sources and then redirect the water outside. And then sinks. So bathroom sinks are gray water. In California, currently kitchen sinks are not considered gray water. Um, so if you can easily tie your bathroom sink in with your shower, it's a great source. The bathroom sink on its own is usually kind of a small amount of water. So you don't typically do a lot of effort to just get that on it by itself. 
And gray water is never from toilets. So is gray water legal? Yes, it is. It's been legal for since 2009 in California. It's regulated in the plumbing code by chapter 15. So there's, you know, it's like 14 pages long. It's a big long code, but basically it's legal. It's um, there's systems that don't need a permit at all, which I'll talk about. And other, if you're ever changing your plumbing, it does trigger a plumbing permit. Many, many communities in California have made effort to make it easy for people to get permits and you go in and they understand gray water and they can help you. And then other communities that hasn't happened yet. So though it's legal, some communities still um, make it challenging for people to actually get a permit. So depending on where you live, who you talk to, that kind of, those kind of chain differences. So Gray water can be used in two main ways. The first way is outdoor irrigation. And I'm gonna focus pretty much the rest of the talk, except for one little tidbit after this slide on outdoor irrigation, because it's the um, plants don't need potable water. It's the easiest to do. It's the most affordable. It's easiest to get a permit and the systems work the best. Um, though toilet flushing kind of common sense can tell us that we really don't need to be flushing potable water down our toilet. But to get gray water to be a good enough quality to be in your toilet tank and then flush down your toilet and be aerosoled in the home, that requires a lot of cleaning of the water. And so systems that do that need a lot of filtration, they need disinfectant, they need a lot of maintenance. And so at the residential scale, there really aren't any systems that work very well um, to do this. Commercial scale, that's different. So if you're at a big building where there's a maintenance person that takes care of all the systems, it can definitely work. But if you're thinking about your own home, uh, definitely look at outdoor irrigation first. And then if you're interested in toilet flushing with non-potable water, rainwater is a better source to look into first. Gray water kind of comes way down the line of uh, what's going to make the most sense. Except for these little kind of toilet, or excuse me, toilet tank lid sinks. This is a simple option that you can do to save a little bit of water. When you flush the toilet, potable water is coming, just fills your tank. So you can get this replacement to the top of your tank that's a sink and you connect the fill line to that little sink. So when you flush the toilet, that drinking water, that clean water just goes through that faucet and you can wash your hands. It's just immediate use. You can wash your hands, then it fills your tank. So that's a, something small that people can do that not, doesn't cost too much and doesn't require many changes to the home. So now we're going to talk about irrigation outside. And so whatever you put in the water is now going out to your plants. So it definitely matters what kind of products you use. So I'm going to call these plant friendly products. These are products that don't contain a lot of salt. They don't contain boron and they don't contain a lot of chlorine. Um, salt, like a, if you think of a powdered laundry detergent that's full of salt, all that white powder. And if you're putting salt on your soil over time, the salt will build up and can harm your plants. Uh, the same thing with boron. Boron is non-toxic to people and animals. Uh, so it's in a lot of, you know, quote unquote, ecological products because it is fine for us, but it's not good for plants. So you want to make sure you're not adding boron. Um, and this is like, if you want it once or twice or probably 10 times use the wrong product, it's not gonna cause a, bit, a problem. It's every, it's daily, weekly over time when it builds up in, a soil, in the soil. That's when the problems can happen to your plants. So you wanna make sure on a daily basis, you're using good products. Um, same thing with chlorine bleach. You don't wanna leach the microorganisms in your soil. So if you're ever using things that aren't good, there's always a way to shut off your system. Uh, and then it's not hard to find the right products. You just have to know what you're looking for. There's a list here on our website. We have a list too. So. Just make sure you're using products that are friendly for your plants. And so another kind of thing, something to keep in mind about gray water, it's not potable water. And that sounds really obvious, but when you think about your landscape, your current, most, most people's landscapes, most hoses, what's coming out of every hose and every sprinkler system is typically potable drinking water. So we don't really have to treat it very differently. But since gray water is not potable, it could have germs in it. You don't want people to contact it. So you have to make sure you design your system where the gray water is going below ground, soaking down, feeding the roots of your plant. It's not in ponds or puddles or sprinklers or buckets or, you know, it's, it's dirty water. So you don't want people to come in direct contact with it. Uh, it also contains nutrients. When you think about nutrients, nutrients in your garden, that's good. That's called fertilizer. It helps your plants grow. But if nutrients get out into a creek or into the storm drain, which then leads to a creek, 
that causes algae to grow, which is nutrient pollution. The algae grows, it takes oxygen, it makes the water quality lower for the other living things. So gray water should never be used too close to a water body uh, or near a storm drain or something where it could actually get into a water source. And then lastly, because gray water is not potable, it could have germs in it, you don't want anyone else to eat it. You don't want it to get into their body. So root vegetables, that's a kind of food crop that people grow where the water touches the edible part of the food. Um, you would think, well, if someone, you know, if they're not going to just pull a carrot out of the ground and eat it, they're probably going to wash it. And yes, that's true, but just to be extra safe, gray water should not be used to irrigate root vegetables or any type of edible plant where the water touches the part you eat. It's fine to irrigate like a fruit tree where the food is above the ground, the gray water is below the ground. That's not um, a health concern. It's just the actually getting gray water into your body. That's the health concern. Um, and maybe I'll uh, pause there to see if there's any kind of basic questions. And then I'm going to start talking about the different systems and how you actually use the water, the gray water. Are there any questions so far? Is that okay to pause? That's totally fine. Um, I don't see anything in the chat at the moment, but folks, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourselves or raise your hands. I have a question about you say no vegetables like does that include like you couldn't water a, a, a lemon tree and stuff like that um no it's the part like a root vegetable a root vegetable, root vegetable. Okay. yeah as long as the food is above the ground it's totally fine to irrigate i had another question um so for example like i use just like unscented castile soap for almost everything is that okay uh for plants yep No, Laura, this is Harriet. Um, I, is, has there been any, um, well, what about the microplastics that come out of our fleece clothing that end up in the wash water that, you know, now people are recommending we put filters on our washing machine to filter that out before it goes out into the oceans. Is there any concern about the, those microplastics going into the, your uh, lawn or yeah. yard area? That is a good question. So we know that they're a big problem when they get into the waterways because they get into the food chain and animals eat them. Mm -hmm. So it cause a lot of problems. So the best thing would be to not use them at all to keep them out. But if they're going to be used, it's much better to keep them on the land rather than have them get into the waterway. So a gray water system would keep them on the land and it's not going to, I don't think it would harm your plants, um, though I don't think anyone has researched the effects of microplastics on the terrestrial um, environment. But I would just intuitively think it's a lot better because it's not going to be eaten by little things in the water and get up into the food chain. Thank you. Hi, I, I have a, a question. Um, actually two questions. One is, I, I, you know, in my, I, I'm in a one story home and there is hardscaping around my home, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, cement patio and that sort of thing. So it's a little bit hard because you would have to go, is there a way to like bypass that? And then the other question is about um, composting toilets. I mean, we're talking about water, you, you kind of address toilets but I don't know if you know anything about uh, that as well. Yeah, so your first question, um, well, hardscape is a challenge with these systems because you have to either go under it or around it or go through it. And if the hardscape goes right up against your house, you have to cut the concrete. So it's just a small channel, a saw, you know, concrete cutting like a skill saw can cut it. So you would cut a groove, lay the pipe, and then you could repatch it with concrete or you could put gravel there or whatever you want to do um, but it just adds a little bit of time for the installation uh, and your second question maybe we'll save that to the end because that's a different topic but i love i love talking about composting toilets okay so i'm going to keep going and then we'll have time for more questions so gray water contains lots of lint and debris and microplastics if you're using that kind of material in your laundry hair grease, gunk, um, and that has to go somewhere. And so with the simple gray water systems, we use mulch in the landscape to act as a filter. So 
the system is designed to prevent clogging. So all the stuff can go through the system, the piping is big enough, the outlets are big enough where it can just pass through and then it lands in mulch and that is where the filtration happens. Uh, this is very, it's a very effective filter. It's also very low maintenance. Um, when you, if you try to keep all that stuff out before your gray water leaves the home, you create a maintenance like you have to clean out the filter by hand. And that's the number one source of system failure is people trying to filter it before it gets outside into the landscape. So we use mulch, mulch wood chips in the simple gray water systems to filter the gray water. It also acts like a sponge. It soaks up the water. It provides this big capacity. So if you do extra laundry or extra showering one day, there's a space for that water to go. And then it soaks down over time. So it's really simple. I mean, it's just wood chips, but it works excellent. It's an excellent filter for gray water. And all the biological material, excuse me, all of the biodegradable material can just break down in, in the wood chips. Microorganisms will break it down. Earthworms come. There's a lot of activity to decompose the material. And we build what's called a mulch basin. So this is a, um, like a, a trench or a circle um, dug out around the plant that you want to irrigate and it's filled with the wood chips. So that's where the gray water goes. You can kind of think of it like spot irrigation, like each plant you want to water, you create this trough, like a drinking trough for the plants. It's full of wood chips, which is the filter and the sponge and the gray water goes in there. It's filtered, it's soaked up, it spreads out and then it soaks down over time. So these are very kind of simple, easy to do um, and they work really well. And then we also need a way to control the water to, to shut the system off. So of course the water has to go somewhere. If it's not going to your gray water system, you wanna redirect it back where it used to go. So a diverter valve just allows you to control the flow. It can either go to the landscape or back to the sewer or a septic if you're on a septic. And there's different valves based on the kind of system you have, but this, the concept is the same. You need an easy way to send the water back where it goes. So maybe you do wanna dye your hair or bleach your hair or on occasion, use something that's not really good for your plants. Yeah. You can send the water back. Uh, and gray water systems, they can be very, very simple. Like the picture on the left, there is a sink. Uh, water flows through the pipe. There is an, an angled pipe from the sink going to a basin near a plant. That's super easy. If I gave you a pile of parts, I bet all of you could build that uh, just by looking at this picture. The picture on the right, this is also a gray water system. This is, I'll call it a high tech system. This system can pull in gray water. It does filter it. It goes into a drip irrigation system that's controlled by irrigation controllers. If there's not enough gray water, it can pull in from other supplies of water like a rainwater system or the municipal supply. The filter gets automatically cleaned by itself and you can monitor all this on your smartphone. Um, so it can be very high tech. Of course, the cost <laughs> is really different. Um, the complexity, who can install it. Um, I don't think any of us probably could install that if we had all the parts, but it's also a gray water system. So just know there's a wide range of from the very simple to very complex, and they're all just strategy, all, all ways to get your water from in your home out to your landscape. And what's best for you really kind of depends on your landscape and on your budget and on all those kind of logistical factors. The simple gray water systems are really good for watering your bigger plants. If you have trees to water, if you have bushes, vines, um, pretty much think about like a tomato plant and bigger. Any plant that's that large and larger is going to be a great source, or a great plant to irrigate with a simple gray water system. Because the simple systems, they can kind of spot irrigate, like I mentioned before. They can't spread out the water over a huge area, but they do really good at directing it to certain plants. And your plants, like your trees, they need a lot more water. So often you'll find that with your laundry patterns and your washing machine, you really only have enough water for four trees or maybe five trees. And then you can easily do that with a simple system. So you can have an affordable system, low maintenance. Uh, does, it doesn't have to be fancy and it's still gonna make your trees really happy which is the goal. Lawns or small plants, they are not suitable with simple systems, but the more complex systems can irrigate that type of plant. So this picture is just to show you a good gray water irrigated landscape. Um, you can have trees, bushes, you can have a lot of really low water use plants that don't need irrigation that can still make it through. And then you can spot irrigate around these landscapes and keep the whole landscape happy with gray water. You can, this is not a lawn, this is not like huge flower beds, 
little, lots of little tiny plants. These are bigger plants. And this is very well suited for a simple gray water. Here's another picture of a gray water irrigated landscape. There's a fruit tree and then around the fruit tree, there's different flowers and other herbs. And the water is directed at the tree, but all around it, those other plants can also access the, the water. And so the first simple system I'm gonna share with you is called the laundry to landscape. This is just one kind of system. It's always from the washing machine. It takes the water directly from the drainage hose of the machine itself. So you connect it right to your machine and now you can control the flow, send one side of the valve back to the sewer. The other side is gonna go out into your landscape. So it doesn't change your plumbing at all. And because of that in California, you don't need a permit to install the system. You didn't change anything about your house. You now have access to this water and you can direct it to your plants. There are basic guidelines you need to follow to be compliant with the code and they are to promote health and safety. Um, really simple things like don't water root vegetables and if you're make sure you're a certain distance away from creeks and things like that to protect the environment and protect people. Um, they're not hard to follow at all. You can see the cost. This is a couple hundred dollars in parts. It's totally suitable for do it yourself project, if you put in a drip system, if you build a fence, if you do kind of home improvement projects, you can build a system. You're going to need more information than in this introductory webinar, but with a book or you know, tutorial, you can definitely do it yourself. If you want to hire someone, it's usually a one, one or two day job, kind of depends, like, do you have to cut concrete or do you not? You know, those kind of factors will affect the price and the, the, comp, the how long it will take to install it. But you can see it's relatively on the small side of a home improvement project. Um, so you take the water from the machine, you direct it out into your landscape, and you have identified what plants are suitable and within reach, um, and you irrigate them with your washing machine water. Here's some pictures so you can see what it looks like. In the landscape, that's kind of what it looks like. It all gets covered up. There are limitations, of course, with this, limitations on how far you can spread out the water, how far you can go, a lot of kind of details that you should know about if you're, if you're ready to build this. And when it's done, there's not a lot to see. It's all subsurface going into the basins. Where the gray water comes out is protected to prevent clogging. Um, those little green lids, those are irrigation valve boxes, and that's where you can access the, the points where the water is coming out, and that's where you would check on your system. So the picture on the left, it's a row of fruit trees. Picture on the right, that's a bunch of different perennials. Um, and those are both are irrigated with the laundry system. So another kind of yard that's irrigated with the laundry system. So now I'll talk about the other kinds of gray water systems and everything else is going to require someone to cut into the drainage plumbing of the home and put in a diverter valve and that triggers a plumbing permit because now you're changing your plumbing and you can have a very simple kind of gravity flow gray water system on the other end, but you are triggering a plumbing permit. Some communities, this is like a lowest cost permit over the counter, really straightforward. Other places, it triggers like three different permits from three different agencies, really expensive, nobody ever does it. So it kind of depends on where you live. And if you live in a place where they make it really you know, onerous, then that's a place to try to change that because it shouldn't be onerous to try to reuse your water in a really simple way. So here's a picture, a diagram of another kind of system. This one is a gravity flow system. So you do have to change the plumbing. You do put in a diverter valve. And if you have the setup where your yard is lower than the pipes and you are able to access the pipes, that's kind of the first thing that you need, then the water can flow by gravity. It can be divided using fittings and very passive. There's no energy. It's a very um, robust system and it can flow out into your landscape. So again, it does require a certain site for this to work and it does require a permit. Uh, the cost is a little bit more than the previous system I showed you and the professional installation also more because this system takes a lot more time. You have to slope the pipes, you're using gravity, which is great because there's no, it doesn't break, there's no um, extra energy used, but it does require the pipes to be sloped um, particularly. So it all flows right. Here's some pictures. Those are the diverter valves under the home. 
Um, you want to be able to easily control the flow. So if you actually have to crawl in a crawl space to get to the valve, that's not going to be easy for you to change the direction of the flow. So you can add a motor to that. It's called an actuator. It just sits right. It gets mounted right to the valve and then it plugs in. So it's not too, it's not too much harder to, to add this in and you don't need to do special wiring as long as you have an outlet somewhere to plug it in. And then you can have a little switch in your bathroom and you can control your system with a switch. Here's some pictures. Um, this picture, this yard is in San Francisco, so it's a very small yard, but it's a good example. This is a one bedroom, one bath home. That's their entire yard. So with their shower water, they diverted the shower in the garage. Um, the plumbing is nice and high, easy to, to access the shower, put in the valve, send the water out, and then divide it up through this branch drain system. And so by gravity, the water flows out into these basins. The plants are planted next to the basin, and then they um, soak up that water. Here's what that system looks like. The picture on the left was right after it was installed. And the picture on the right is the one year later. And so this home, they never watered their yard again. They just don't have any irrigation need in their landscape. Um, most, many yards are bigger than this. And also many homes have more uh, water. And so this can just show you how a portion of maybe for your home, this would just be a small portion of your yard um, could be irrigated by your shower, but maybe you have another shower, maybe you also have a washing machine system and that irrigates other portions of your yard. Uh, sometimes you can't use gravity and you want to use your shower gray water, so then you do have to pump it. If your landscape slopes uphill, you have to pump the gray water. If you have a patio or um, a big deck or something around the home where you have to bypass it before you get into the landscape and it's flat or up, upward sloping, you have to pump it. And there are relatively simple systems that can pump gray water. This picture is showing a simple pump system. The water flows into this tank. It's not storing it, it's just temporarily collecting it. In the tank is a pump, it's made for dirty water. When the tank fills up, it turns on the pump and the pump pumps out all the water and you send it out into your landscape to your plants. It's a little bit, it can be more challenging to install this because you have to locate this tank. Um, you also need an outlet to plug it in. Maybe you're outside and there isn't one. There's a few you know, complications that can arise, but overall the system is relatively simple. Permitting can be a little harder because now you have pressurized non-potable water. So that's more of a concern to regulators, but there is a pathway to get these kind of systems permitted. And here's some pictures, kind of what this looks like. The picture on the left, this is a home that has a basement. So this is located in the basement. The picture on the right, this home has a crawl space. And so the, the tank, it's called a surge tank, it's just temporarily collecting up that water. It had to be buried under the house. So that was a lot of labor to get that installed. But after it's in, now the water gets pumped out into your landscape. And then lastly, there are some systems that try to remove all the gunk and hair and lint before it goes out. And the only reason to do that is if you need to use drip irrigation. And so this picture on the right is just an example of drip irrigation. This is not a gray water system, but just you can see that the water comes out little bits of water all along a small a tube, or it could be little tiny emitters. And so it really is spreading out the water over a large area. And for gray water to go into that, it has to be filtered a lot. And then the filter has to be maintained. Um, and that I mentioned before that these kind of filters are the number one source of system failure because people don't like to, I mean, nobody likes to clean a yucky, slimy gray water filter. And so if people think, oh, I'll install this kind of system and I'll just do it myself, um, not very probable that that will happen over the long term. So sometimes people install these kind and get a maintenance contract with the installer. Um, but other than that, they're usually not a very good option because they just aren't going to withhold time and um, our busy lives. And also just to note that gray water going into drip, it can't go into just your regular drip system. So if you already have a drip system, you cannot put in this, this kind of filter and then send it into your existing drip. It's still too dirty. It has to go into a special drip system that's made for dirty water. It's usually um, kind of the systems that are made for like septic effluent. Um, not just regular drip irrigation. And there, these are some examples of companies that do this kind of system. Um, these companies have filters that 
automatically get cleaned. So they will last longer and require less maintenance because on a regular basis, the filter gets what's called back flushed. It gets washed backwards with potable water and gets cleaned out. Um, so these kind of take you into a different category of system and the cost is a lot higher, um, but these are an option. Water Sprout is a local company um, that mostly works new construction um, or like major remodels, but these are kind of high-end, high-end homes, high-end systems. They're, they're an option. And I just want to note before we end for more questions um, that there are bigger scale systems that I'm not talking about. Like in San Francisco, they have a lot of large scale water recycling systems. Some of them use gray water, some use other alternate water supplies, and they are a big kind of complex system that then can clean the water enough so it can flush toilets or other non-potable water needs in the building. So there's some really cool local examples of this happening at a big scale. The technology is really different because it's just a whole other kind of system, um, but the concept is the same as on, reusing on-site water. And so if you go to kind of think about your landscape and think about water and think about gray water, it's nice to take a little step back and look at your home and think about all of your alternate water sources. So look at where you might collect rainwater and use that. That's another um, often underutilized resource that comes to our home. So you could collect it in a tank. You could use that for your vegetable garden. It's easy to use rainwater into a drip system. Um, rainwater is easy to use in, in places you need cleaner water. You can also have a rain garden where you take the, gut, the runoff from your gutter and send that into an area that's designed to soak up a lot of that water. And that helps protect the environment, prevent flooding, uh, stormwater pollution, um, keeping your water on site, as well as really um, moistening the soil on your site. And then your gray water, looking at your different fixtures and thinking about which ones can I, you access? Um, and then where could you send that water? In this picture, the shower is next to a side yard where there can be fruit trees irrigated with gray water. And the washing machine is next kind of in the back of the house and that water can be pumped around because the machine has a pump in it. So it can go a little farther. It can push that water around, irrigate some perennials, a privacy screen, a berry patch, and it's bypassing like a play area, which maybe that's a lawn, maybe it's not. Um, there's lots of different opportunities to have usable areas that don't require a lot of water. Um, and so just before I end, I want to note that if you are building a home or thinking about building a home, or if you are working with any cities there, it's a great time to think about gray water before the house is built. And um, there is a, it's actually called a drought ready ordinance. It's a model ordinance that you can share or use the resources from of how to plan homes so they are ready for gray water. Um, it's, it can be expensive to go back and do a lot of plumbing changes in a home, and it's really not expensive at all to do it the first time. So when the plumber is plumbing all the pipes, if they just put in that valve, cap it off before it gets outside or right outside of the building, then that home in the future can easily reuse the gray water. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. And there are communities in California considering this. Some of them have done variations of it, but that's definitely a future um, a future possibility and um, movement around reusing water is making sure our homes are built from the get-go with this in place. So I'll just end with a few resources. Graywateraction.org is our website. We have online classes. Some of them are free and introductory, kind of like this one, a little different, but bas basically the same. Others are longer, um, more in-depth. We also do some workshops. Um, we do a lot of partnering with other organizations in the Bay Area, so there are some hands-on workshops through some of the other organizations like Sustainable Solano, Sustainable Contra Costa, they often host hands-on workshops. Um, and then uh, my book, it was written to help people design and install. So it's a how-to book, Greywater Green Landscape. And then we also just have a lot of resources. We have information in Spanish and in Mandarin um, on the website too. So that is the website. And then I'll, I'll stop for questions and comments. I have a question. Um, so if I'm doing my um, patio, like with concrete versus um, concrete versus on sand, uh, what do you see the water do? Is it uh, one way is better than the other? Yeah, if you can make any landscaping soak in the water, that's going to be better. And if you can't, then directing that water somewhere where it can soak into the ground. So if you 
did do a concrete patio where it ran off, then you could do a basin to soak up that water, but better if you did something that could actually infiltrate in the, the patio itself, if that worked. Like using natural stone on sand, you think is better than like- Yeah, on. yeah, because the water can soak in all, all the gaps in between. Okay. But do I need to worry about like along the house, um, the water can um, kind of like get into foundation or something or? I'm sorry, I'm pretty ignorant in this area. Just uh... You would want to, so if you're going to infiltrate a lot of rainwater, you always, I think it's 10 feet away, it might be 20. Um, I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but you do want to get away from your house before you do these basins to infiltrate a lot of rainwater, like okay. directing the runoff from your home. All right, thank you for the answer. We, we do have someone, Carol, with her hand up. Carol, do you want to go ahead and ask your question, and then I'll ask a couple from the chat. Sure. Um, so thanks very much. I read your book, Laura. It's really great to hear you talk. Um, I had a quick question. Um, I'm building a new house in Sea Ranch, um, and I don't know if they have a gray water uh, expert up there or if you know anybody. Um, and the pump system, can the, can the tank be actually in the yard? Because my the lot slopes and the main house is below the courtyard, inner courtyard. Yeah, the tank is often buried next to the house, so it can be in the yard buried. And, and do you know where is Sea Ranch? What, what are you near? Sea Ranch, it's in Sonoma on the coast. Okay. Um, we, on our website, Graywater Action, we have a, a in the drop down about Graywater, there's a hire an installer tab. And okay. anyone who's gone through our professional training who is actively installing, we list there. Okay. So I don't know off the top of my head, but you could look there. To... And do you have a good resource for washing machines and how much water they use? Because I don't know why manufacturers aren't required to state this data, but it's very difficult to find mm -hmm. how much yeah. water a washing machine uses. The easiest way is to, I think it's, well, to, it, they now weigh the clothes so they put water in based on how much clothes are, are in there so I think that's why it's harder for them to say though maybe they're just not being helpful I don't know um, yeah. but the an easy pretty easy thing to do is you get a container that's about the amount of water you think is going to come out if it's a front loader you can get two five gallon buckets and you just literally you hold the discharge hose and you you have to think about spillage and that kind of thing but you just collect the water for one time of you doing laundry based on how full you fill the machine um, and then you can see if yeah. you have a top have loader a that's a lot harder 30 gallons of water if you have a top loader it's a front loader front it's loader. Awesome. yeah so front loaders are usually around 15 um and they half of it comes out in the wash and then half in the rinse so you have time to dump the buckets and bring them back right so that's actually 30 gallons total right um no they're about 15 altogether so the okay. wash would be eight or so or Time to buy a new washing machine. Cool, thank you. Um, I have a question in the chat from Alan. Do you also do rainwater catchment systems or have information on your site about that as well? We do have information on our site, yeah. So there's another question in the chat, Laura, do I remember correctly that the pump in a washing machine shouldn't be used to pump the gray water any further than up into the spill pipe? That is, doesn't it still have to be gravity fed from there rather than pumped using the washing machine pump? Yeah, that's a great question. So the machines are typically rated to pump a few feet above the rim, like if you are kind of in a lower, to pump like up into a sewer line. And so instead of doing that, you can pump across a flat ground we, we use 50 feet as the safe rule of how far you can go on a flat yard. So in, if you're not going like up above the washing machine rim, if you're going like just down outside, then you can go flat about 50 feet. Um, yeah, so there, there are, there's definitely more, more limitations around that washing machine that I didn't mention at all, because it's just very, very in the weeds, but in, very important if you're going to install the system. There's an additional question about any attempt to capture fog for home use or replenishing water supplies. 
Um, I know that fog collection is being used in some places. I have never heard of it for in the US, like US homes. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I actually, I personally have a question. Um, you had mentioned, I think in one of your books, um, a very easy way to, to access your water would be to tap into your reverse osmosis system. Do you have suggestions around that as well? Um, sometimes people just have water draining out and I don't, I don't, if you can drain it out to a plant or something like that, but I haven't seen like full system set up for that. It would just be like, what, what works for you? What's easy. Do you happen to know if that water is considered gray water or is that considered somehow cleaner water, more like rainwater? I do not know what it's technically considered. Okay. Sorry. Do we have other questions from folks? Anybody want to raise their hand? Looks like Greg Schaefer has another question in the chat. Greg has given a lot of thought to this, it looks like. Greg has said, thanks for this, Laura. I have been so excited to install an L to L uh, system ever since I saw it on Ask This Hold House. You were the expert in that episode, weren't you? That's so cool. Thanks for doing both this webinar and your broader work in general. And Carol. And Carol is wondering about desalinization. Um, well, that's, <laughs> that's a very broad question, but so desalinization, it takes a lot of energy to get drinking water from salt water. And it's a huge environmental impact to build a, you know, that kind of plant. And then there's the brine discharge. So there's some quest questions about the safety of the environment with these plants. Um, and I think the short, my short answer with that is why it doesn't make any sense for a community to consider a desalinization plant if they haven't done all the conservation, done all the reuse that can be done much cheaper and um, with a less impact. So I would say that maybe way down the line that could that might be a choice or a good option if there's no other options. But most communities have not even tapped their conservation um, potential. So hopefully I answered. I'm not quite sure where, where, where you wanted me to go with that. Um, somebody in the chat asked you to loop back to composting toilets. Oh, right. Um, so flush toilets, that water is called black water. And at the residential scale, it's not safe to reuse. There is a way to reuse it. All the wastewater can be reused through um, you know, different systems, but kind of a retrofit in California, that's not an option. Um, but it is, a, it is a resource for sure. Composting toilets are a waterless way to manage the pee and poop. Poop contains more path. If someone is sick, most of the pathogens leave the body you know, through feces. And so fecal transmitted pathogen is a big concern and it's a big problem in globally because it contaminates the water that people then drink. So a composting toilet is a really safe way to manage human, what we call waste, um, and basically just collect the material and then compost it in isolation. Uh, so there's no potential vectors, you know, transmitting any potential sicknesses. So um, there's a couple parts. There's what you sit on that can be kind of normal. Then there's somewhere to collect the material. Um, some composting toilets have a big chamber underneath where the composting actually happens. Others are more a smaller, they're like a collection system where you collect the material. You always are covering it with sawdust or wood chips so it doesn't smell or doesn't look gross. Um, and then you might remove that material and compost it outside, but there's always a, a compost location. And then there's the user. So composting toilets take maintenance, they take more interaction. Um, and so there's the, the man kind of management plan is the other part. Um, in California, you can't really you get permission to use a composting toilet instead of a, your flush toilet in your home, your permanent resident, but there's nothing that says you can't also have a composting toilet as like a secondary toilet. So sometimes people use them in their home just to save water. Um, cabins, you can get permission to use them in like a cabin, like seasonal use. Um, there's a wide range of applications. And then there's the big ones, like there's one in San Jose at, um, I'm forgetting the name of the building, it's an environmental center. So there's big composting toilets that are done in, in large buildings. 
um, where the material, there's like kind of a little, very little water to flush the material and then a large compost chamber um, in the, the basement of the building. Mm -hmm. There's one, I think it's in the Presidio somewhere. There's instead of a porta potty, there's a composting toilet. So you'll find them here and there. Um, and then people use them in their, in their homes or their cabins or on their boats or wherever. I think you effectively answered this question, but there was one in the chat around regulations around composting toilets in California. So it sounds like it's easier to do in a kind of supplemental living space rather than in your yeah. truly, truly installing one in your home. Yeah. Um, and then there's a question about the, the, that style of sink you showed us to refill the, the toilet tank. There's no need for that to be treated, correct? That can just go directly into the yeah, that can go right into the tank um, because you can't like turn it on. So you're not going to like brush your teeth or anything. It's just a, a direct hand washing. So all that would be was a little bit of soap and then um, hand washing. Uh, there's a question about maintenance on rainwater capture, at, like a cistern from a downspout. Do you do you know do you know about those systems? Could you give us a little bit of information on those as well? Sure. So with a rainwater system, you know, rain is is very pretty clean. It does pick up dirt and debris on the roof. And so with the rainwater system, the system is trying to keep out the leaves and the dirt. So there's different components in the system to keep all that stuff out of the tank. So when you're when the water gets to the tank, it's the cleaner water. So there's some screens that need to be cleaned on occasion that will catch leaves and things. Um, there's a piece that it's called the first flush diverter. So it catches like the first flush, the dirtiest water that does drain out and that needs occasional maintenance, just you know, opening it up and letting the water flow out or checking on it. Um, and then other than that, the system doesn't really need much maintenance. And what I'm describing is like an outdoor separate rain system that just you would tap into it like with a garden hose or your watering can. There are systems that are gonna have pumps and filters and disinfectant that then can bring the water back into the home and that's a whole other kind of system. So I'm imagining the questions around like a, a backyard rainwater system that you would be using for irrigation. And that has very, very low maintenance. Do we have other folks with, with questions? Looks like there's one more question from Leah Basel. Uh, Leah says, yurts and tiny homes generally use composting toilets, then it makes them non-viable as low-income housing due to the regulations not allowing them. Yeah, I think California um, has a lot of room for improvement around codes with composting toilets. And there are conversations happening around fire rebuild communities who want this as an option. Um, so maybe this year or next year will be the time where that those regulations change. Um, but cur yeah, currently California is really does not allow them as a an op as a alternate sanitation system, though other states do. So if anyone is interested in working on that and wants to, you know, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, I am definitely interested in that. It's something I'm, I'm working on in kind of other arenas right now. I would be curious as kind of a policy follow-up since we do have a number of folks involved in climate reality who are quite active on the policy side. Would you recommend ways to get involved if we're looking at some of the larger infrastructure or other ways of, of reusing at kind of the, the city or, or county level? I'm sorry, I didn't quite process. Sorry, your... I, I'm I'm wondering if there are ways of getting involved uh, around 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 policy around changes for some of pushing for some of those larger systems and things that you that you mentioned that obviously take some some larger will than people just in their homes. Um, yeah, I think right now, if people want to let me know if they're interested in kind of where they might fit in. Um, Right now, there's nothing direct people can do, but I think in the future that will change. There will be opportunities to help support a state change. Um, so I'll just stick, I'll just throw my email in the chat if anyone is interested in working on policy change or has represents organizations, um, we can stay in touch.
All right, this feels like a good opportunity to ask folks if there are any final questions. And if no one pops anything else. Was, oh, Carol, go ahead. I was wondering, um, do the wood chips need replacing or renewing and how often? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. And that's the about once a year maintenance, um, which is, I mean, every, every system needs some amount of attention. And so these simple gray water systems, <laughs> it's about once a year. And that's okay. pretty doable for most people. So you really want to design your garden to, to really think about these mulch beds. Yeah, they can blend in. I guess it depends on what your yard looks yeah. like. <laughs> okay, cool, thanks. All right, well, thank you everyone for all your fantastic questions and Laura for your wonderful presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, and then I'd like to send it back to Harriet for any final Climate Reality Bay Area announcements. Excellent. Well, I hope everyone will join me in uh, a round of applause for this amazing, informative um, engagement this evening. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for organizing. Thank you so much, Sue, for supporting this evening and all of you for being here. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements about some upcoming events. Uh, the last week of October, we'll be hosting an event to provide an overview of the upcoming UN FCC Conference of Parties COP26 and ways Bay Area climate advocates can make an impact. Uh, we will tie that into um, the Climate Reality 24 Hours of Reality, which is a 24 hours of, of action that happens on the 29th. Uh, this event is in its final planning stages. It'll appear on our events page soon, and all of you will receive an email notification about it, just as you did for this event a few days ago. So look for that in your email boxes. Uh, on November 3rd, we're hosting an event on sustainable food by default. Uh, it's on the power and possibilities of plant-based diets with Katie Cantrell of the Better Food Foundation. Uh, it also is in the final planning stages and you will receive a notification about that when it is up and available for registration. We hope to see you at both of those. Great engagement opportunities on important things. Um, I might also encourage you to check our events page on our website or our YouTube channel. You can find both of those by Googling Climate Reality Bay Area Chapter. Um, you can check out the events that we've had in the past with some amazing varied speakers. All of our content is available either on our events page or the YouTube page. Uh, speaking of sustainable food choices, our chapter treasurer, Leanne Imamoto, is undertaking a fun project to put together a cookbook of plant-based and vegetarian recipes. Uh, and she asks that if you are interested in participating and contributing to that, that you please send your favorite plant-based recipes, uh, particularly those for the holiday season to her. And I will share her email address in the chat in a minute. Um, and I think that brings me to the end of our announcements. Just check out our website, climaterealitybayarea.org. Congratulations and good luck with, to all of you that are attending the Climate Reality Leadership Training next week. Um, thank you all for being here and for the amazing support we've gotten and to Laura for this really incredible presentation. It was really inspiring uh, for, for all of us.